welcome to Spilling Chai on the Pain Gap. I'm your host, Anusha Hussain, and I could not be more honored to introduce to you Dr. Neil Shaw, our guest for this week. If you have read my book, The Pain Gap, How Sexism and Racism in Healthcare Kill Women, you already know that he is quoted and cited throughout my book because not only is he one of the foremost voices that really raise the alarm about America's skyrocketing C-section rates, but he's also one of the biggest and strongest um, allies for women's health and rights. I'm gonna quickly read you an abridged version of his bio and I highly recommend you go and look up his work because it is truly incredible and I could not be um, a bigger fan. Dr. Neil Shaw is an assistant professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School. He is also the chief medical officer of Maven Clinic, the largest virtual clinic for women's and family health. As an obstetrician gynecologist at Beth Israel, Medical Center in Boston, Dr. Shaw cares for patients at critical life moments that range from childbirth to primary care to surgery. As a scientist and social entrepreneur, he is globally recognized as an expert in designing solutions that improve healthcare and is listed among the 40 smartest people in healthcare by the Becker's Hospital Review. His work to build equitable, trustworthy systems of care has been profiled by the New York Times, CNN, and other outlets, and he is featured in a forthcoming documentary produced by Oprah and <laughs> Oprah Winfrey and Jens Ford. I mean, what else can you say? He's endorsed by Oprah. <laughs> I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. This is great. Perfect. Okay, sorry. Uh, first of all, Dr. Shaw, you are, I am, gonna try really hard not to fangirl because you are a huge personal hero of mine. You're quoted all over my book starting on page 160. And I, I, am, I cannot believe I'm speaking with you. So thank you so much for giving me your time. I don't even know what to say to that, but um, <laughs> the feeling is very beautiful. So I'm excited to be talking to you. Thank you so much. Well, I know you're busy, so I'm going to start with uh, my first question, which is you have done so much to raise awareness around America's astronomical, astronomically high C-section rates, which have increased 500% in the last generation, in one generation. The current U.S. cesarean C-section rates is hovering roughly about 33%. And the World Health Rec uh, World Health Organization, who recommends that it's about 10 to 15%, that it stays about 10 to 15%. Um, how, what do you say to, there are so many women who still think that C-sections are the safest birth option, the best uh, uh, birth option. What do you say to, to people who think that? And are they wrong? Well, the first thing is Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I think I muted you. You're on mute. There you go. Sorry. There we go. How's that? <laughs> That's much better. Okay. So yes, you were saying. Are those women wrong? Think, yeah, I mean, the last thing I'd ever want to do is invalidate somebody's experience. Um, I think, you know, everyone who has gotten a C-section, most of them um, or many of them uh, felt like it was necessary, you know? And so um, I don't want to sort of pile on to all the judgment that already comes with childbirth. At the same time, generally speaking, we know that we do too many. And there's a lot of conventional wisdom around what's driving it. Uh, one thing that is almost certainly not true is that it's being driven by women themselves. So, you know, the C-section rate goes up by 500%. And there's this narrative that, you know, women are demanding more C-sections. That doesn't seem to be true. Less than half a percent of people electively request a C-section. Um, there's also this effort to sort of blame the C-section rate on people's health and how that's shifted. So, you know, over time, moms have become older than they used to be. Um, there's more chronic conditions like hypertension and diabetes. Um, but even if you're a healthy 18 year old today, your odds of a C-section if you're pregnant are almost twice what they were when you were born. So like bottom line, you can't blame women for the C-section, right? You definitely can't blame women. And I think what's interesting is that, um, I mean, I had an emergency C-section my my first time, which was incredibly traumatic. You know, I, I almost died, my baby almost died. But I feel like there's this kind of 
rush, you know, to always, I didn't, I wasn't aware that I had a, a birth a choice. <laughs> You know, I thought it was either natural or, or C-section. And then my second time, you know, it, it was a planned C-section. But I guess my point is I work in this sector. I work in this field and I was still so unaware about the dangers of C-section. And sometimes when I share my story, some women are like, well, who wants to be, you know, giving birth for like 40, 30 hours? And it's so much it's so much more civilized. And especially, you know, I have a lot of family in Bangladesh who, who will say stuff like that to me. So I guess my question more is, what do you say to them that actually, no, it is your risk of clotting, hemorrhaging, so many things, that is such an invasive major surgery. And we're kind of made to think about it as, going to the drive through I don't know, drive through fast food. <laughs> there, there is something about, you know, the fact that we're all born that I actually think makes it harder to be empathetic to uh, each other. Like, you know, um, there's, there's uh, this thing about childbirth where we seem to normalize the status quo, no matter what it is. So there are parts of the world where uh, maternal mortality is even higher than it is in the United States. And there's a lot of fatalism around it. You know, really similarly, where I am right now in New York City, the C-section rate is one in three people get major abdominal surgery and one in 10 of their babies goes to the NICU. And that's been like normalized because you like literally look to the left, look to the right, and somebody's had a C-section and they seem okay. Um, you know, I think the other challenge is that moms are fundamentally resilient um, and they're sort of expected to put themselves last to put their families first. And so if you've had a C-section, you kind of like, you know, that's been your experience. You just assume that you're gonna do it again and kind of suck it up. Um, and the truth is that a C-section is a major surgery um, and that takes like major recovery. It's way harder to take care of a newborn infant with a 10 centimeter incision in your abdomen than without one. Um, but often that's not part of the consideration. Also, not to interrupt you, but like, why didn't any, why doesn't anyone say that to you? <laughs> like, nobody told me that this was a major surgery and you don't get the time to recover in America because as we know, we don't have any paid parental leave, paid maternity leave. Um, so everybody, I don't know, it took me about like 18 months the first time to get feeling back in my stomach. And I saw this interview with you where you said each time that you have a C-section, you said that up until the third time, it could be like operating on a box of crayons. Tell, explain to me, explain to our viewers what you mean by that. Yeah, um, so we're the only surgeons, obstetricians that cut on the same scar over and over again. Like if you're a vascular surgeon or um, a general surgeon, if you have to go back and operate on a place that you operated before, that's a bad day in your work week. But for an obstetrician, that's like a Tuesday because most people have more than one baby. And if you have a C-section the first time, in the United States, you have a 90% chance of getting one the second time, whether you need one or not. So basically like if it's the first time that someone has had a C-section, you can train a brand new doctor how to do that surgery in a couple of weeks. The second time you actually have to operate on top of a lot of scar tissue. And that makes the tissue planes harder to uh, see. They kind of fuse together. And uh, the melted box of crayons metaphor is like the second, the third, the fourth time that you're doing it, all of the different organs can kind of fuse together, including the placenta, which is a big bag of blood vessels, gets 25% of everything the heart is pumping. And um, if it doesn't detach properly, uh, people can bleed and sometimes even bleed to death. Let me unmute myself. Okay. Well, thank you so much for clarifying and explaining that because I loved, I, I love, I didn't love that metaphor, but I thought it was very, very powerful. So well, America, it, right? it's, like, yeah, it is. Thing. Like, I think if, you know, if you need a C-section, one of the things we're very fortunate about in 2022 in you the United that. States, you can get a safe one. Yes. You can get probably a quick one. You know, I was yes. trained to from skin to baby in 30 seconds and it's oh. designed to be a rescue surgery. We're yeah. really, really good at rescuing people. The problem is, uh, as we've increased access to this capability, we've seemingly gotten worse at deciding when, when it's truly needed. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, it, uh, it, yes. It just feels like hospital births and C-sections are just offered as, it, you, you're kind of trained to think of it as the gold standard. You know, that's what you're just supposed well, to want to get. Or it's the, best. the most common surgery performed on human beings. Yes. It is also uh, the decision to do a C-section, in my opinion, is the most common and consequential surgical error in the world um, because we're so bad at deciding when people need one. Yes. Oh my God, that just gave me uh, the chills. 
Um, you and I know this, but for our audience, you know, America has the highest maternal mortality rate amongst rich nations. It's a number that's going up. And of course, there's a huge racial aspect to this with black women, women of color, you know, more likely to die from pregnancy related complications. But black women are 243% more likely to die from pregnancy related complications giving birth in America than their white counterparts. Um, you once said, and I quote this in my book, I loved it so much because I felt like when, you know, pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, especially when you're, when you're kind of talking about race in the, it was, it was a little controversial, but I think the pandemic has just made it undeniable. The role of racism um, plays in America's maternal mortality uh, crisis, maternal health crisis. And you said that there's no way to understand what is happening in America without putting it with maternal mortality, without putting racism front and center. Talk to me about that statement because you were kind of raising the alarm and, and calling this out at a time when it was still pretty controversial to say that maybe we have a race issue in the healthcare system. Well, it was We're controversial to say racism was yes. the cause. Sure, I mean, um, at least as an obstetrician, it's kind of amazing to me that three years ago, that was uh, a really controversial or even edgy thing to say, whereas now I think um, part of the progress, uh, which is, you know, still far from where we need to be, but part of the progress is like, that's a given. <laughs> um, I think we're at a place now, especially after the George Floyd summer, where people see the way that racism operates in our society writ large. Um, and um, I've even heard people say uh, that, you know, um, sometimes as a black woman within the maternal health system, it can feel like the equivalent of being like, you know, a black man being pulled over at a police stop. Um, in terms of just the way systemic racism tends to operate. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess this is this is a hard thing, right? Because all of us, when we're, we're growing up, we're taught that racism is evil. And so it's really hard to recognize it in ourselves. And um, part of what I think our racial awakening in the country has led to is the understanding that racism can be interpersonal. And we see a lot of that. It can also be systemic and it can also be structural. But the ways that we see that play out in maternal health is that we have actual algorithms that determine um, the cutoff for anemia or the cutoff for when someone is likely to have a successful vaginal de delivery that take race into account and functionally make it harder for someone who's Black to access services. Um, and also for a really long time, I feel like pre-pandemic, people were had really kind of racist explanations for this gap. They'd be like, oh, well, it's because black people are less educated or black people uh, are, you know, welfare queens. And then now we actually have stats and studies that show that if you're a college educated black woman, uh, you're five times more likely to die <laughs> giving birth in America than a white woman with a high school degree. So it's really becoming clear and the data is backing that it's racism, not race, that is driving America's maternal health crisis. Yeah, I know. And, and you know, the last thing that I want, I want to do is terrify anybody who's listening. Um, you know, at the same time, I think <laughs> that's my have, job. No, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, these statistics are really hard. Right. But part of what we're seeing is that maternal health is really a bellwether for the well-being of society as a whole. So if moms in our country are unwell, society is unwell. And that's why we see every injustice in our society show up in maternal health. Um, you know, th these are injustices that pervade all of society, right? But whether it's gender equity, racial equity, geographic equity, when we look at the plight of rural Americans versus uh, Americans who live in cities, or even this idea of generational equity. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting right now is that, you know, there's um, a large group of Americans who are thinking about quote, making America great again. And then there's a large group of Americans that are thinking about building back better. But both are kind of tying into this idea that hope and opportunity in the United States is eroding. And the leading indicators of that are things like maternal mortality. The fact that if you're a family today and you're trying to, or you're trying to start or grow your family, your odds of dying in childbirth are 50% greater than your own mom. And then on top of that, you layer these inequities. The fact that you're three to four times more likely to die if you're black. I love I love that you brought up that point um, about how maternal health is an overall indicator of women's 
is an indicator of women's overall position in society because a lot of people just think that these are the rates of the number of women dying in childbirth, which they are, but they also indicate women's overall position in society and how our healthcare system is functioning. I mean, it's amazing to me that in 2022, we still, we still kind of uh, approach women's health as a women's issue, not a family issue, a national issue, an economic issue. So I love, I love that you uh, make that point. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, so in my book, um, The Pain Gap, I talk about the pain gap in women's health, uh, but there's also a credibility gap and a knowledge gap. Very little is still known about women's health. And it wasn't, and I really want to talk to you about it. I'm like, please help me understand. It wasn't until the 1990s that there was even a mandate to include women in clinical trials. And it wasn't until 2014 that we started talking about the widespread gender bias in trials um, and even started acknowledging them. Why do we continue to exclude women from clinical trials? And uh, shouldn't we want to know more? Why do we still approach women's health as an enigma? That is a great question. And I, I will say, like, I come at this question with great humility. When I was um, in my mid-20s, the last thing I ever thought I was going to do was become an OBGYN. Um, and um, then, you know, in my OBGYN rotation in medical school, I actually did it first to get it over with because it was the one thing I was definitely not going to do. Um, and for the first time, I saw what people who have a uterus go through and uh, have been following that curiosity ever since. Um, and so, you know, my, my perspective is like someone who doesn't have that lived experience, but is sort of curious, like, why, why? Those like same very questions that you asked. Um, and before that, you know, I'd spent time um, thinking about, it, th these were the days of the Affordable Care Act being stood up and we were thinking about how to make the healthcare system better writ large. And uh, was seeing that there, there were all of these ideas to innovate and, um, progress our delivery system that were not being applied to the population of people that I was trying to take care of as someone training in OBGYN. Um, I mean, the crass answer, not even crass, I mean, like the, the blunt answer is some combination of paternalism and misogyny. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, are there too many? Are there too many old white guys just all still running the show? Is that what it is? And our standard for health, our idea of it is—is is it still a middle-aged white man? Is that the standard? Well, the thing is, like those those older white men—they're not bad people, but they have the perspective that comes from their lived experience, and that's what, exactly why representation matters so much. Um, you know, one of the great honors of my career is um, uh, one of the advisors to the National Institutes of Health Office of Women's Health Research. And it's an office that was sort of newly stood up because there are important gender differences in sociology and biology that impact people's health and it deserves deliberate attention. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of fixed beliefs in society around, um, you know, just uh, honestly, like the, the irony is even if we look at COVID-19 and uh, vaccination um, and the data and just the ham handedness to message how important vaccination is for pregnant people. It came from what was theoretically a good intention to protect pregnant people by excluding them from trials, but it turned out the impact was the opposite. Um, and I think really correcting this requires humility from people who don't have that lived experience and then fundamentally structurally changing the system so that we have more people in leadership positions who uh, have the perspective of someone who, you know, has been pregnant themselves. Yeah, well, this is this is the thing. I mean, I we, I felt like with the COVID vaccine, COVID nineteen vaccine trials, we saw this happen in real time. We saw how pregnant women were completely excluded, and not to mention that seventy percent of frontline workers are women. You know, we had we had such a duty to kind of let them know, and it was it, just like you said, this paternalistic kind of well, we must protect this unborn child. But I was reading about how historically the only vaccine that really uh, had negative impacts on the fetus was early trials with the polio vaccine because if there isn't a live virus in the vaccine it doesn't i just thought it was so interesting that in real time we got to see the country <laughs> the world actually put the life of this unborn child ahead of ahead of women and really women pregnant women were kind of left on their own to decide if they should get well, it or I, not i think that that's a really deeply held belief because even today among women themselves at, at maven clinic we fielded a survey you know we, we found out someone brought to my attention 
one of my colleagues that only one in five pregnant people were vaccinated earlier in the fall. And we realized like that's our constituency. Those are the people that we serve. So we, if we're gonna be pushing vaccines, we have to really understand like why that 80% of people isn't getting vaccinated. And we fielded a survey just to ask them what their perspective was. And in almost all cases, it was concern over the well-being of their fetus, which, which is the thing. Like it's a deeply held belief across society that um, the well-being of the fetus comes first. Without, I think, always understanding the full implications of what that means for the person carrying the pregnancy, and um, as a result, in our system, we largely treat pregnant people as vessels for their pregnancy um, and almost forget about them afterwards. Yes, yes, um, yes. And you know what, Christy once said that um, it, it's like uh, we, we approach, oh, so Dr. Rebecca Key, anyhow, one of us, um, about how we approach pregnancy, uh, the pregnant woman as a candy, and then, you know, you, we get the candy and we just throw away the wrapper, but the wrapper is, is the woman. And it's so funny because you're really kind of supposed to keep it to yourself, you know? I feel yeah, like complaining. Yeah, that's Dr. Um, <laughs> is the candy and the wrapper metaphor, but it's a hundred percent true. Um, yeah. And we see this like, you know, during pregnancy, uh, people are inundated with messages about what is and isn't safe. And everyone yes. has an opinion um, to the point of absurdity sometimes. Um, and then as soon as the baby is born, all that we have for them is a 15 minute postpartum appointment that only half of Americans even make it to. Yeah. Uh, whereas we have a ton of pediatric visits Yes. And what that means is for people who are really struggling, we're getting like POW level sleep deprivation. Yeah. who have to earn a living wage at the same time because there's no pay, pay family leave, who are recovering from a C-section at the same mm -hmm. time. Their only access to the healthcare system is through their baby and through their pediatrician. Yes. Oh my goodness, in the, in the richest democracy in the world. Um, okay, this is my last question. And I always say, despite all the doom and gloom, I am actually very help hopeful <laughs> because I feel like the pandemic is giving us a really big opportunity. Um, it's exposing us and to fix what is, what is wrong and to make that right. So you are um, the CMO at the Maven Clinic. I want you, it was recognized, sorry, as the Fast Company's most innovative health company. Talk to me about the role of digital health and what you're seeing and what you're working on to kind of make, you know, give us these interventions we need to save women's lives and their families. Absolutely. Um, you know, I spent most of the last decade as a professor and um, I'm really proud of the work that we did to kind of get perspective on the problem and maybe get some ideas out there about what should be different. But fundamentally as a professor, I could evangelize what needed to happen, but I couldn't build it. Um, and then uh, about a year ago, um, I started talking regularly with Kate Ryder, who's the CEO and founder of Maven Clinic, and she's a mom herself. So when we talk about- And real quick, not to interrupt, Maven Clinic is the largest virtual clinic for women and families, right? That's right. And it was built by a healthcare outsider and a mom herself um, who, you know, Kate is, um, she was a journalist before she did this, like you, and sort of brought this sort of journalistic empathy to the problem um, and, you know, built a product that makes sense for normal people, which is, you know, um, you can't do a C-section or an egg retrieval through a screen. So what like is digital health really, you know, and um, just kind of took this perspective that, you know, Maven Clinic lives in people's pockets and we can turn people's devices into a portal, into a human service. And um, when I joined, part of the opportunity was to think, okay, if we could connect people to uh, providers 24 seven, anywhere, anytime, how can we deploy that to make people healthy? Um, and uh, in the Medicaid population and uh, across across the entire country. So that's what we're, we're building right now is uh, trying to reimagine a healthcare system where you actually have the access and support that you need. Um, and I'm, I'm really encouraged by what we've been able to do so far. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much. I am so honored and just talking to you is very calming. Something else I want to talk to you about, maybe I'll talk to you about later, is how how much more impactful it is when a, when a man <laughs> is advocating for some of these issues. You're just like, yes. It's funny how we still think about, you know, 
who, who we think well, about as like the experts. There's trade-offs I've learned in my career where I think um, part, part of my um, opportunity to have an impact is being an unexpected ally. Yes. In all the ways, it's like, you know, I am a man. I'm also an OBGYN and people don't expect it from me. They um, really don't. It's incredible. And also, I've had to learn um, the hard way over my career when uh, when it makes sense to use that sort of allyship voice and when it makes mm. sense to actually step back and lift up other voices. Um, so pros and cons to that, but. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work and for your time. I am I am beyond uh, honored. I think I did a really good job not fangirling, don't you? Didn't I keep it like <laughs> calm and cool? I've been talking about you, like I've been telling my husband, I've been telling all my girlfriends. I'm like, don't oh forget oh it's coming. Um, anyhow, so thank you so much. Congratulations on your book. Thank That's you. Beautiful. Writing a book is a huge deal. And that's oh, yeah. so great to have it out into the world. And it thank really you does. That. Thank you so much. I'm here much. to support literally anything that you need or want anytime. So, you know, oh my goodness. Find. I love that I have this on video. <laughs> I will follow yep. up with you. Thank that's you good. so much. Stay safe. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.